I'm just going to spotlight you and uh, take it away. Great. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'm Ann Scott, and I'm, I'm honored to be the head librarian at the Nantucket Athenaeum and to welcome you all this evening. And we deeply appreciate the generosity of Chuck and Dan Geschke who have made these lectures possible. Um, and I believe Nan um, was going to be here with us tonight. And I just wanna thank you so much on behalf of the entire audience. And uh, we'd like to play a brief uh, tribute to Chuck Geschke and I'll share my screen to, to share that with you. The Nantucket Athenaeum is a stronger and more vibrant library because of Nan and Chuck Geschke's vision and generosity. Chuck revolutionized software development, co-founding Adobe Inc. and the PDF with John Warnock. He received many awards, including the nation's highest honor for technological achievement, the National Medal of Technology and Innovation. He and his wife, Nan Geschke, a former librarian, served on the Athenaeum's board in the early 2000s and have supported many of the island's nonprofits as major donors over the decades. Chuck and Nan helped bring Circus Flora to the island as a fundraiser for the Athenaeum and later matched a national endowment grant for the creation of the Geschke Lecture Series in 2005. Chuck and Nan's leadership has provided a solid foundation of excellence and 16 years later, the Geschke Lectures have become the premier event to experience fascinating conversations around cutting edge ideas. And all throughout, Chuck and Nan have remained involved in planning the series as well as attending every lecture. For all that Chuck Geschke has meant to the Athenaeum, to Nantucket and to the community far beyond, we thank you and Nan and honor your legacy as we go forward with this evening's lecture and all that are to come. Thank you. Thank you to the Geshkis and, and thank you to all of you who support your public library. You help us care for our beautiful 1847 building and garden and deliver more than 1300 programs a year and offer empowering services to our community. And we can't do any of this without, without you um, or without our talented staff, our programming staff led by Amy Janess. Thank you, Amy. Tonight, we're delighted to welcome Theodore Johnson and Awista Ayub. Theodore Johnson is the director of the Fellows Program at the Brennan Center for Justice in Washington, DC, where his work explores the role that race plays in electoral politics, issue framing, and disparities in policy outcomes. He's also a retired commander in the US Navy following a two decade career that included service as a White House fellow, military professor at the US Naval War College and speechwriter to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. We will hear about the themes and ideas in his debut book, When the Stars Begin to Fall, Overcoming Racism and Renewing the Promise of America, which outlines a path toward a multiracial, national solidarity to finally overcome the existential threat of racism in the United States. He will be joined in conversation by Awista Ayub, the author of the book, The Kabul Girls Soccer Club, and frequent commentator on issues related to Muslim women participating in sports. She's also the director of fellows program at New America, a Washington DC based organization where much of when the stars begin to fall was written while Ted was a fellow there. Prior to joining New America, Awista worked as the director of South Asia programs at Seeds of Peace and for the Embassy of Afghanistan in Washington, DC as the education and health officer. 
please join me in welcoming Ted and Awista to the Athenaeum Zoom stage. So um, here is the joy of Zoom programs. <laughs> We've lost Ted um, and I'm assuming he's gonna log back in as soon as he can. But at the moment, uh, he's not here. <laughs> so um, let's see. Awista, I don't, I'm not quite sure if we should just hang out and wait or um, I would be curious to hear about the fellowship program at New America that Ted was part of, where he wrote um, a good deal about of this book while he was there. Could you just tell us a little bit about uh, what New America is and, and what the fellowship program does? Sure, I'll keep an eye out for Ted. Um, and actually this was part of my introduction. Um, the Fellows Program has existed within New America since 1999 um, as a think tank. It was pretty unique to have journalists and writers connected to the work of the organization, um, which for those who might not be familiar with DC, um, it tends to be more uh, academics. We have Ted back. Oh, uh, good. Ted, I was just oh, talking my <laughs> about the fellows program. Um, so good timing. Um, so I'll go ahead and just start. Um, okay. Amy, if that's okay. Yeah, that's um, great. Great. Thank so um, just quickly for the audience, you know, we've existed as an organization for quite a few years and uh, every year we bring on a group of fellows. Ted is one of those fellows who joined the organization back in 2017. So Ted, it's quite an honor to have this book in my hands. Um, and I remember meeting you actually my first day at New America, uh, you're working not too far from my office and you were telling me about this great book and this idea that you're working on. So it's always amazing to see it come to fruition uh, years later, right? Um, so I will yeah. talk a little bit more about process with you. So I, I've seen you kind of go from an idea to an actual book. Um, so, and thank you for that introduction. Um, as a reminder, we will take questions. Um, so I'll set aside about 15, 20 minutes at the end of the conversation for your questions. Questions. I know everyone's familiar with um, Zoom by this point, but do submit them through the Q&A function. I'll be sure to get them. Um, and if you send them in early, I'm also happy to intersperse them with my own questions um, and really kind of ensure that the audience is engaged throughout this conversation. Um, so Ted, before we dive into the themes of your book, When the Stars Begin to Fall, um, I want the audience to get a better sense of who you are um, and why it is that you're telling the story, but also to dive into the writing process that you really did undertake these past few years. Um, um, as you pivoted into career as a journalist um, and as a reporter um, and as a you know, prolific writer today. Um, as I mentioned before, we met in 2017 at New America. The book was just an idea at the time. And if I remember correctly, you were also working full time as a consultant and you had this desire to really pivot um, and turn this idea into something more. So can you talk about the book idea to begin with? How did it come to you, you know, particularly during a time when conversations around Black lives was not the conversation that we're all having today. Yeah, so uh, thank you so much, uh, both to the Anthonium and to you, Awista, and to the New America's Fel America Fellows Program to help bring this uh, book to life. Um, so I'll tell you, um, I was a career military officer and um, spent a year at the White House during the Obama administration as a White House fellow. And it was the year that my, that fellowship ended that Trayvon Martin was killed. And I am the father of three black boys. And I was less concerned about what China was doing in cyberspace, which is what I worked on in the military, and more concerned about what sort of nation uh, we were creating and that would be left behind for my boys to grow up in grow up in. Uh, and so I decided I didn't want to be passive in that uh, question anymore. I wanted to be an active participant in shaping uh, both what happens tomorrow, but explaining how we got to where we are today. And writing has always been sort of a pet thing that I've done. And I wanted to hone that ability more and, uh, and, and pivot my career in that way. And so I spent the last few years of my time in the military getting a doctorate in law and policy, and also as a speechwriter for the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, which allowed me to figure out how to write for different audiences and also fill out my knowledge gaps in the way that race plays in our public policy outcomes and in our politics. And so uh, luckily the month that I retired, um, New America said yes to me becoming a fellow and allowed me to translate my dissertation into a book proposal. Now, in all honesty, the original vision for the book was 
explaining Black political behavior and how it was shaped by our history, how it was sort of played a role in our current politics and what that meant for tomorrow. And then Donald Trump won the election that fall. And uh, the world was no longer interested in Black voters. It became figuring out the Trump voter and going to different parts of Appalachia and rural America, sort of the, the hillbilly elegy voter. And um, I was having a hard time breaking through the publishing industry with this idea about Black voters. And so um, on the advice of my agent, I pulled out some and expanded the topic to not just be about race and politics, but about race in America and really about the question of American identity. And, and thinking more deeply about that question that led me to history, to political science, to philosophy, to sociology, and a puzzle, a, a puzzle started to come together for me with all the little pieces of my personal experience, my family's trajectory in America, my military service, um, and, uh, and, and then my dissertation topics about how race figures into politics. And in the end, the puzzle pieces fit together nicely to that's, you know, led to this book and figuring a way that we can create connection across racial and ethnic difference um, in order to ensure government is more accountable to the people and responsive to the will of the people instead of instrumentalizing and, in, yeah, instrumentalizing and weaponizing racism and racial tensions for political purposes or for to hold on to economic and political power. And so that, that sort of, um, uh, moved from the military to this book and this new life as a, a senior fellow at the Brennan Center for Justice is, um, is, is part of the story of, of how this book comes about. Yeah, no, it's really amazing and impressive to see um, that you made that pivot so successfully. Yeah. Um, as you worked on the book, what did your writing process entail? I mean, certainly the story, like you said, it started off as one idea um, and it became something very different later, but it also, you were working on it last year during a time where the country was just becoming more aware of these issues in a more granular way. So what did that mean for the writing process for you? And how did you ensure that your book was current by the time that it came out? Yeah, it's a great question. What I think the thing I didn't really have an appreciation for going to the book writing process was how long it would take. Um, and not just the writing, but all of the things around the writing. Uh, and so it took 18 months to turn my dissertation into a book proposal that someone was interested in, in buying. And a few more months for the things, for the contract and stuff to get worked out. Um, by August of 18, I had a deal. And by September of 19, the book was complete, the manuscript. But then we spent um, several months in proofing and editing and and doing some revisions. And then we didn't want to release the book during the presidential election because um, it would get drowned out in just the, 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 uh, the politics of the day. And so we held on to it. And frankly, I'm glad we did. Uh, if we had published it on the timeline I originally wanted to, uh, it would have gone to print before George Floyd was murdered, before the summer of racial justice protests had happened in the country, before a coronavirus pandemic, uh, before a very divisive and contentious presidential election, and before the January 6th Capitol insurrection. All things that speak to the themes in my book, both as proof of the possibility of, of, of a, a multiracial national solidarity and of the pitfalls, the sort of backlash uh, to this kind of solidarity. And so um, by holding on to the book, I, that allowed me to revise certain chapters, uh, insert uh, some writing there that accounted for what was happening around us, like George Floyd's murder, the racial justice protests of last summer and the Capitol insurrection on January 6th. Um, I, I'll tell you, I, I'm a serial writer. By this, I mean, I cannot skip around in my writing. I can't write chapter three and then go back and do two. I can't write um, the middle section of a chapter and then go back to the beginning and I can't write the end. I have to write every sentence in the order it shows up in the book. So as you read the book, the sentences you are reading could only be written after I had written the previous sentences. And so this, um, it can sometimes be problematic because uh, I know where I want it to go but the getting there was difficult sometimes and I would be stuck in the getting there, even though I knew ultimately where I wanted to end up. Uh, and when I would get stuck, the, the part of my process was reading other writers, uh, Tressie McMillan Cotton, uh, W.B. Du Bois, um, Eddie Gloud, um, Nicole Hannah-Jones, um, and just to get a sense of how other people told stories about history, how other people use the beauty of language to evoke emotion, and how people um, described scenes 
in order to put the reader there, even when those scenes are in service of a, an abstract theory or framework. And so the reading helped me and, and I, I read poetry. Sometimes I listened to like R&B or soul music uh, like Marvin Gaye and some other folks to sort of get me in the, in the mood of, of uh, evocative and provocative uh, prose in, in a way that um, was uh, in, incorporated more senses than just your eyes in the reading. And so that that process uh, was a long one, but it was, I think, uh, I, I'm, I'm pretty confident that it resulted in a better product if I had just approached it very um, sort of clinically and um, without this uh, this um, surrounding myself with these other forms of art to, to, uh, to pull it together. Great. No, that's helpful to know. I mean, I think um, for if there are any writers in the audience, it's always helpful to, to hear others kind of work through that process. So let's shift to the book. I know there's a link in the chat to, to buy the book. Um, can you take a few minutes to actually provide the audience with a general overview of the book? Um, and also yeah. in answering that, also the title of the book, where did it come from and what does it mean for the story that you're telling? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I, I've I, I described the book as a three-legged stool of three-legged stool. So it's like this big stool that like each of its legs is made of a different collection of ideas or theories. Um, so first the title, the title, When the Stars Begin to Fall, means a couple of things. And it's, it's supposed to signal to the reader that we have a choice, that mm -hmm. um, if we are willing to do the hard work of confronting racism and creating the America of our ideals and that are, that's in our sacred text, the Declaration, the Constitution, um, we can either uh, do the hard work and then the stars will sort of fall into place as we create this first ever multiracial egalitarian democracy or the stars will sort of fall out of the sky as the nation collapses on itself because we fail to meet the moment and we've created something that doesn't resemble the, the, uh, the nation of our, of our principles, of our values that are enshrined in our, our sacred text. But the actual words themselves comes from an old Negro spiritual that enslaved the black people used to sing uh, prior to the end of the institution. And the song was ostensibly about the rapture and the sort of the Christian um, theology where people were ascend to heaven after Christ returns. And a lot of times enslaved black people were not allowed to sing about what they really wanted was emancipation and freedom and liberty. And so this song is actually about that, but cloaked in Christian themes because plantation owners allowed them to sing Christian songs, but not to sing songs demanding freedom. And so the song, uh, Oh Lord, What a Morning When the Stars Begin to Fall is, um, uh, is actually about a demand for emancipation and hoping the nation will live up to its promise. So the, the book sketches out how we can achieve a national solidarity that moves us a little bit closer. Uh, the first three-legged stool uh, says first that racism is a crime, uh, is a, a, a threat to democracy, uh, to America, sorry. Racism is an existential threat to America. And by this, I mean that the presence of racism in our society um, is, is a threat to the idea of America not to the United States, the nation state, which shown, has shown that it can live uh, quite comfortably at times with racism, but the idea of America, the promise of America, that we're all created equal, that we have these unalienable rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that cannot coexist with racism, with racial inequality. Either we are all created equal and we have these rights, or structural racism can persist, which means we are not all treated equally and, and some of us have less access to these rights. The second leg of this stool says that um, national solidarity is the best way to overcome racism. And by this, I don't mean eradicate racism, which I, I don't know is possible, but that we can overcome racism's effects or mitigate their, its effects. So while racism may always be with us to some extent, if we can reduce the impact that it has on people's lives, their lived experiences, their, their life chances, their outcomes, then we will have done a service and moved the nation closer to being that more perfect union. And then the third leg of this stool says that Black America and the experience of Black people in America provides lessons and attributes for this broader multiracial national solidarity. And that if we identify those attributes, we sort of paint a picture of what the national version could look like. Not that Black people uh, exclusively hold the answer, we don't. Uh, any group that has been oppressed in America or in our history or that has fought for inclusion all have something to teach the nation, but that Black Americans have a particular experience. Um, and so then the next two set of stools I'll run through very quickly. 
the three attributes I call out in the book um, that Black Americans have to offer is a, a political strategy I call superlative citizenship, is when Black Americans have met all the burdens of citizenship, even when they knew the nation did not recognize them or treat them as full citizens, like serving in war, the Revolutionary War, the War of 1812, and then being returned to slavery after they fought for the nation, or not being not receiving GI Bill benefits after World Wars I and II, despite um, serving honorably in those conflicts. Uh, the second um, issue, or the second attribute is uh, what I call trickle down citizenship, which is when a group marries a moral claim to the uh, uh, making a moral demand of the nation state to the nation's interests, which often aren't tied to an absolute sense of morality or sense of ethics, but is governed by just bare state interest. And so the civil rights movement is a great example of marrying a moral claim like racial equality and then leveraging the fact that the nation was at war at a, in a cold war with the Soviet Union and exposing the hypocrisy of the United States saying it's a democracy uh, that believes in freedom for the people. And then, you know, they're prosecuting or persecuting um, uh, black Americans under Jim Crow and that exposure, the exposing of that hypocrisy actually was harmful for Cold War purposes for the nation's interest and that helped move the civil rights movement along. And then the last one is about the kind of solidarity um, in, in the group of black, uh, black people as a group, black Americans have a, as a group that is formed in opposition to the uh, institution of slavery and the oppression of Jim Crow as a way of sticking together in order to push the nation to fulfill its promises. The last thing I'll say is this last set of, of, of ideas for the, the third leg of this of the three stools is um, the uh, the first is that the kind of national solidarity we want to see must be color conscious and not color blind. Um, it doesn't demand that we wash away racial and ethnic differences, but that we accept racial and ethnic differences and find connection anyway. So we shouldn't, uh, we all have particular histories and paths to America and we should honor that. The second says that racism is a crime of the state. It's not something that white people did to people of color, but something that a, a, a structure that the state, the nation state allowed to exist and perpetuate that created outcomes um, that were dis uh, where disparities were revealed across lines of color, race, ethnicity, et cetera. And so the state is culpable for allowing it to, to persist. And then the third thing is that um, the only thing that really unites our diverse nation, over 300 million people, different races, ethnic ethnicities, religions, customs, cultures, is a belief in the American idea. And so the book calls for uh, an adherence to the American civil religion as a way of connecting us by in belief and in practice to the only thing that unites us, and that's our belief in, in these principles. And then the book kind of wraps up with a set of, of um, policy recommendations and conclusions that uh, I think will can, can sort of facilitate the creation of this national solidarity the book calls for. Great. I mean, that's a lot to unpack for sure. Um, <laughs> yes, a time. reminder too for our, our audience to submit your questions. Um, I'm curious as you you know present this three-legged stool, um, and it's it's very solid your argument for for this kind of framework. Um, as you started to talk more about the book and present these ideas, what's resonated the most with people um, as you kind of yeah get feedback now from an audience? Yeah, and so the the thing that is that I think I've been asked about most and people find the most interesting is the idea of superlative citizenship. The, mm. the idea that, um, that when the state is in breach of its end of the social contract and citizens overperform their duties um, as prescribed in the social contract, that that is a political strategy um, by again, exposing the hypocrisy of what the state is and who it says it is, the, the gap there, and how that allows, that actually returns a sense of agency to each one of us. Um, and it sort of gives us an idea of what we can do in our immediate sphere of influence to push the nation to live up to its principles, its ideals. Um, another version of superlative citizenship, I talked about some of the military um, ways that, that it's been expressed, is uh, the politics of respectability, which has kind of fallen out of favor in the current Black Lives Matter protest movement, because there's a sense that if, if uh, Black Americans, for example, are educated and speak properly and dress properly and have good etiquette and these sorts of things, then um, their humanity and is recognized, their dignity is recognized, they'll, they'll be seen as, as compatible with American culture and therefore will be less um, um, 
exposed to abuses of state power, discrimination, and that sort of thing. Of course, that's not true. Um, if I, I'm a military veteran, you know, I have advanced degrees, and I've still been <laughs> discriminated against by in law enforcement, in department stores, etc. So you can't behave your way out of racism. But what respectability politics was a century ago was a very deliberate political strategy by Black women in churches who worked and often worked as domestics in the homes of uh, folks who held racist views. And by working in their homes, they were the most exposed to physical violence, to sexual violence. And um, their argument was, or their thinking was, that if they can show how, uh, display their humanity in the way that they present themselves, that it is harder to justify the brutality that they experienced um, if people saw their culture as inferior or their intellect as inferior or biologically inferior. And so by basically being a perfect American and culturally, uh, both in dress etiquette, but all, also in mannerisms, that it was a, an explicit counter argument to the idea that black people were inferior and therefore um, sub they're, they're being subjected to a harsher treatment or inhumane treatment was in some way justified. So that that was um, a kind of superlative citizenship that frankly, the men of the civil rights movement hijacked and used for their purposes that proved very effective. Uh, when you think about protests in the civil rights movement and you see black men and women in their Sunday best in suits and dresses, and you see them being attacked by German shepherds and policemen with batons and fire hoses, um, and you see that visual on your TV screen or the newspaper, it's not very hard to imagine who is the barbarian in that picture, who was behaving in a way that's not civilized and who's behaving very civilized and even looks more civilized. And that was an intentional strategy uh, to a messaging strategy by the civil rights movement that picked up from the, uh, the respectability politics of black church women in the early 20th century. Mm. Um, you touched on your time in the military, actually, and it sounds like that falls under the superlative citizenship category mm -hmm. for you um, mm -hmm. within the framework. Um, and I want to talk a little bit more about that experience for you, especially as a Black man, in terms of serving for your country, but then coming home to America that was still struggling to overcome racism. And what was that like for you coming back? But also, as you wrote this book, how it sounds like that it sounds like that experience has really informed the conversations you're having today. And so I'm curious as to how, you know, what is it yeah. that you took away from that experience and how has it kind of really brought you to where you are today in terms of the writing that you're putting into the world with this book? Yeah, so the, the military um, exposed to me the, the best of America and then mm -hmm. the areas where we've got to do much better. Um, I, I was, the, you know, a few days before I left for military training, I was stopped by police for having a blown headlight, but they admitted after stopping me that um, they saw a cigar that I had in my hand that I had been smoking with buddies celebrating my imminent departure for the military. And they thought that it was a blunt or filled with marijuana simply because of the, the caricature of like hip hop, you know, rappers and that sort of thing. And so, and because I was an absent-minded college student who was preparing to leave for for uh, military training, my license was expired. But instead of allowing me to contact family and have someone come pick me up or just tell me you can't drive, but you can call someone to come get you, um, they took me to jail and, and I spent the night in jail. And while I was there, um, a, a black man with dreadlocks who was bleeding from a, a, a bruise on his head uh, was thrown in the cell with me. And I'm a terrified 22 year old kid. Um, I've been stopped by police multiple times in uniform. I've been trailed by department store employees in uniform. Um, I've been told by the guys that I was serving with that early promotions were basically affirmative action handouts for me. Um, and sort of all of this sort of, um, when I was selected for the White House Fellowship, uh, another colleague flat out asked me, how much is that is because you're black. And so these things happen in the military. And yet um, it, my time in the military was proof and remains proof that it is absolutely possible to make friendships, enduring friendships across regional, racial, ideological, political difference. Um, I have buddies in the military who are hardcore, who are still hardcore Trump supporters, and will wish me happy birthday every year, or will um, you know congratulate me on a New York Times article I've written that they agree disagree with completely, but recognize um, that. 
uh, the, our bond that we formed in military service, that they know my heart, they know my character, and they know that ultimately, even if we disagree on how to improve the country, the fact that we both want a better America is the thing that we have in common. And so the idea that undergirds this book, that it's possible to create a multiracial national solidarity is absolutely grounded in my military service, both in belief in the constitution and American principles, but also in exposing me to other Americans who I never would have met otherwise. And and so when I hear the caricatures or stereotypes of other groups, I actually know people, have friendships with people in those groups that are that can defy the caricatures that um, that others are putting out. And one of the recommendations in the book is this need for uh, breaking down. Many of our, our social circles, whether social media or in real life, are highly segregated. Uh, something like only 90, 90 percent of us or so only have one person of another race or ethnicity in our social circle. Uh, and so the fact that we don't know one another, we are democratic strangers in this large country, um, makes it very easy for uh, those who want to divide Americans to, to pit us against one another because we don't have enough exposure to each other to, to um, overcome or be resilient to those stereotypes uh, out there. And so the military uh, sort of showed me a pathway um, of how you can create solidarity, even in an institution that isn't perfect. Mm. Um, you write in the book that at times as a Black American, um, it is here that you said that you face some of your deepest disappointments. Can you elaborate more on that? Yeah, and it's, it's um, and this kind of hinges on the superlative citizenship piece as well, but it's just, it's just the idea that um, we, at, at every turn, every president, no matter the party or the course of our history, has always turned to the principles on which the nation was founded. They repeat the rhetoric in our, the Declaration of Independence and the Bill of Rights, the Constitution, and the great orators of our time, George Washington, Frederick Douglass, Abraham Lincoln, Martin Luther King, uh, and, and everyone's saying the same thing, that we want a nation where we're all treated equally, where we're not hampered by government infringing on our rights, but we're sort of given liberty to be self-determining in our path. And yet um, people use that very language to exclude others. Um, we, we are a nation uh, that was created on the premise that all men are created equal and we enslaved people at the, in the same breath. Um, we are a nation that fought a million casualties, uh, killed and wounded in the Civil War. And within a decade, we allowed um, uh, racists to use terrorism throughout the South to yank back the hard won constitutional rights that have been extended to those who were formerly enslaved and, and didn't and, and allowed that to persist for 80, 90 years. And so in a nation with, on, founded on such high-minded ideals with such promise and potential that's had the opportunity to make uh, hard decisions at very critical inflection points has made bad decisions and, uh, and moved us in the wrong direction despite all the sacrifices, including war, that got us to the point of progress uh, upon which that we, we backtrack from. So it is, it is a nation um, that has seen tremendous progress, but then has often responded to that progress with backsliding and sort of backlash. I, I am much happier being a black man in 2021 than in 1921 or 1821. So that is a sign that we have progressed, but I am also a black man who, um, who fears for both himself sometimes, but especially for his, his boys, his children going out into this world who may not extend any grace or compassion to them, despite um, you, you know, uh, all evidence to the contrary that they're, they're good kids uh, simply because of how race works in our society. Mm -hmm. Um, so this next question is a bit multifaceted and it probably hits into the recommendations in, in terms of your conclusion. So I'd love for you to kind of spend some time there. Mm -hmm. Um, but, you know, as we take into account that we're a very diverse country and that, um, there's a diversity of thought and ideas and this idea of sol solidarity is maybe, maybe, you know, a lofty goal. Mm -hmm. I'm curious about how people as a collective can start working towards that. And I assume that maybe that, you know, within the recommendations is where you're kind of able to present some ideas for, for your readers. And I'd love for you to kind of just unpack that a little bit. Yeah. So you're absolutely right that this is a hard goal. I, it's easy for me to, to write a pathway, a blueprint for how to establish it, but the doing is incredibly 
difficult. And it mm -hmm. is frankly, the project of the United States. The whole point of this experiment is to show the world that it's possible to create a multiracial egalitarian democracy. And if we fail, we will have showed the world that it's not possible to build this thing, or at least we weren't the people that were capable of doing it. So how can we con create this connection? Um, this kind of goes back to the one of those legs of the stool of the mini stools that says racism is a crime of the state. Presently, every time racism comes up, it immediately pits one group of people, usually white people, against another group of people, usually people, you know, people of color at large, but often it's black people, and says, you know, in order to overcome racism, white and black people need to figure this thing out. And one side will say, I didn't enslave people, so why do I have to pay for the sins of, of people from hundreds of years ago? And then the other side will say, I am still suffering the effects of an issue that went unaddressed or insufficiently addressed for far too long. And so why should I be forced to to remedy the thing in, in a society where I'm already at the lower end of the hierarchy. But what's happening here is that um, those with power are kind of making racism seem like it's an issue between two groups of people, and it's not. Racism is a problem for everyone in this country. White Americans are harmed by the presence of racism because as long as racism can be used to exploit divisions in our society, the government doesn't have to deliver on its promises in full to any one of us. Anytime, if the people are saying, we want universal background checks for gun possession, we want uh, more affordable health care, we want more affordable colleges. And, uh, and someone can say, well, you would have that if not for those black people over there who don't work hard enough and are, and are sucking out of resources out of the social safety net, or those immigrants over there who are cheating and, and not paying taxes and, and, you know, but using all your school property tax money and this sort of thing, then they weaponize us again against one another. And as we bicker, guess what? No one gets cheaper health care. No one gets better schools, better public schools. No one gets um, the, the things they're asking for from the government. And, and as a result, and we don't have to guess at this, the data shows it that uh, white Americans in terms of suicide, drug use, that has all increased over the last few decades. Uh, and and you know the other racial disparities around criminal justice and jobs, employment, pay, et cetera, continue to persist. So by reframing this as an issue the people have with the nation state, with the government, instead of an issue between two groups, then we find a reason to connect across difference in order to improve the lives of ourselves, but more importantly, improve the country for posterity. How can we get there? I'll very quickly mention the five recommendations I make in the conclusion. Uh, the first is that we do need to reform our institutions institutions and processes of democracy so that it's more inclusive and participatory. That means making it easier to vote, getting rid of gerrymandering, getting rid of big money in politics so that those with a lot of money don't put their thumb on the scale of our democracy, those sorts of institutional procedural things. We need more civic education and not teaching Americans how many branches of government there are, but teaching Americans how to be better citizens on a daily basis in their communities and not just on election day every two or four years. Uh, we need a program of national service. And this definitely stems from my time in the military because, because we don't know one another, um, we don't know how to work together and a program of national service will put us in contact with more Americans who are different from us and then provide us a mission or a superordinate goal we can work toward. Um, uh, uh, the fourth thing is deliberative democracy, uh, where we come together and debate issues. And then the consensus of this town hall or citizen assembly is a binding decision that the city council or the mayor or the organization has to adhere to so that we arrive at decisions together. And then we live those decisions, the, the outcomes of those decisions together um, instead of electing representatives solely and then having them sort of pursue their interests and force decisions down our throat. And then the last thing is the need for transformative leadership. We are still a country that loves its heroes, loves its exemplars, and we need uh, local and national leadership to sort of model what a national solidarity uh, looks like for the country. Great. Um, I have some more questions, but there are questions that are starting to come in from our audience. So I'll pivot and then we'll kind okay. of go back and forth if needed. Um, again, a reminder, do buy the book. It's amazing. Um, and there's a link in the chat. Um, we have a question from Jay Wilberforce. Um, and he says, what are your views of the analysis of Adolf Reed. I don't know Adolf, um, but he is among other things, um, a writer for the nation. Uh, he's also taught at UPenn and is originally from New Orleans. And I don't know if his work is familiar to you. And if so, mm. can, you, um, can you comment on it? 
Yeah, I'm not too familiar um, with with his work, um, but but uh, my, if he writes for the Nation, he's probably um, arguing for a very progressive version of this sort of um, what Jesse Jackson called like a rainbow coalition. Um, mm -hmm. And and in in some respects, I the National Solidarity model reflects that that sort of the workers or the people coming together making demands of the state. But mine is still rooted in a um, in a capitalistic democracy um, and, and not in a, a more progressive kind of democratic socialism. Uh, and, and part of that is because it's uh, the that, that kind of capitalism is, is very rooted in American society. Um, if you look across, you know, color, and et cetera, self-determination is still kind of a, a very American thing. And yet we recognize that uh, economic inequality has run way out of control, especially over the last few years. And, and there's a need for a strong hand in government to get that in the economic inequality uh, back under control. So I'm for a highly regulated capitalistic democracy that um, appeals to workers, labor force, the public um, on, on, a, on having a government that, you know, look, our de declaration says that government derives its power from the consent of the governed. And as long as government can use racism to pre prevent the governed from ever giving consent, then government runs roughshod over us and can spin out of control. So to the extent that uh, the people can um, mandate a highly regulated government to be responsive to the will of the people in a way that is structured that um, so that people are not left behind, but get to uh, benefit from their their own work and ingenuity. ingenuity um, I'm for that, um, but a, a complete restructuring of our society um, is something I think is just a bridge too far. I think if we have national solidarity, then the kind of government we have um, will produce better results because we have a public that cares about one another across lines of difference. Mm, that's great. Um, that kind of leads into this next question. I'll just um, kind of just give you the main takeaway, but um, an anonymous attendee asked, why do we even have labels such as African-American? Why not just mm. American? And in many other countries, citizens are just labeled as one type, like Brazilian, for example, is one of the um, ones that they listed. So we'd yeah. love to hear your response to that question. Yeah, I, I'll tell you. Um, so, I mean, even in Brazil, it's it, like there is a massive racial inequality in Brazil between Brazilians of Portuguese descent and Brazilians who descended from African slaves. And I've been to Brazil, um, uh, both in its its uh, the the nation's capital as well as some of its more touristy areas. And the inequality is rampant. And uh, even Brazilians recognize the that the, the racial inequality is especially um, tough in Brazil. Um, so um, Afro-Brazilians are a, are, are a group and a very large group and experience racial inequality there. Um, but more, I think more to the point of the question is uh, France, for example, has banned the collection of racial demographic data by government for decades. And mm -hmm. just a few years ago, it unanimously decided to take all mentions of race out of its constitution in pursuit of being a colorblind society. And, um, and, and that has been a mixed bag. Um, if you look at the demographic data that can be collected, um, that has to come from surveys since government doesn't collect it, um, you will find that France's prison population is largely uh, folks of Arabic and African descent. If you look at um, folks have done things like hiring people calling for apartments or calling for jobs, and if they have an Arabic or an African sounding name, they get called back less for apartment applications or for job applications. Um, we know that the pay disparities exist there. So just getting rid of the label doesn't get rid of the racism in society or the racial inequality, or racial discrimination. And so I argue that um, the fulfillment of the American prog promise is recognizing the disparate paths that folks have had in our country and then crafting public policy to address those disparate paths all in service of one goal, that we're all treated like Americans with the uh, full rights and privileges to, to the, the um, full access to the rights and privileges of citizenship. So as an African-American, as a black American descended from people who were enslaved, my path in America, my, my family's narrative, which I, I talk a lot about in the book, is different from someone who, who is the great grandchild of an Irish immigrant 
or the granddaughter of an, a Chinese immigrant or um, descended from Native Americans or you know, is Native American and, and uh, descended from folks who are removed from their land, et cetera. And so washing away all of those histories, all of those stories and saying, you're all American, you're all equal. Now this, from this point forward, let's just do stuff that's universal universal, and doesn't account for your histories, your cultures, your, your differences. I don't think it's the fulfillment, fulfillment of the American promise. I think it's a, a way to try to shortcut our way to a quality without doing the hard work of accepting difference, recognizing commonality, and then building a society that does both. It's extremely difficult uh, because of how diverse we are, but that is the true fulfillment of the American promise. Mm. That's great. Um, again, we have about 10 minutes left, so if you have any mm. additional questions, submit them. Um, so, you know, Ted, you mentioned your children. I think you have two sons, if I remember, or three sons. Three, three. <laughs> three, three boys. Um, and so I'm curious about when you see them growing up in America, in the America today, um, it's a different experience than the childhood you had. Um, how do you compare your experience to, to theirs? Are you hopeful? Like what, yeah, what is their takeaway in terms of even this conversation on solidarity and how do they respond to it as young adults growing up, as, as young black men growing up in America today? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, and, and so in many ways, we're very similar. Uh, my, my parent, I'm the grandchild of, of black sharecroppers who, who were indigent and grew up in Jim Crow and died under Jim Crow, um, all, you know, all but one. Uh, but my parents were first generation college graduates and spent 30 years at IBM each. And so I grew up uh, the child of, you know, very, in, 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 middle class, solidly middle class in uh, the white suburbs of Raleigh, North Carolina. And my children are solidly middle class and they've grown up around the world because of my military service, but now live in a predominantly white suburb in the of, of DC in Northern Virginia. And so in that way, uh, they're, we're very similar. They both went to good schools. They both believe in education and, uh, you know, respecting parents and um, sort of the, the benefits of hard work, et cetera, et cetera, recognizing the presence of racism, but that um, you can't allow the presence of it to completely derail you from the things you want to accomplish in the country and recognizing that there is a path uh, for opportunity. And yet um, that the path for us is more difficult, more arduous, filled with more obstacles and barriers than for uh, one of their white friends who are similarly situated with different, again, a different past, a different history. Um, the biggest difference though, is that social media has changed the way they interact with the world in a way that it didn't exist for me. Uh, and so we had, you know, I grew up in the, I was born in 75. So the eighties were really the bulk of my childhood. And this was before cable news was a big deal, certainly before cell phones and, and, um, uh, you know, social media and that sort of thing. So radio stations and the three major news networks were where people got their news from, and it was kind of the same story. And you, um, you weren't inundated with opinion uh, all the time. And now everything is easily accessible, really sensationalized, incredibly polarizing, and you can't turn it off. And that's the world they're growing up in. So when a black man is killed, um, you know, in any town USA, the death is on their phones and they can't escape it. And so the corollary is I was a, a junior in high school when Rodney, I was a sophomore when Rodney King was beaten and the videotape came out and I was a junior when the policemen were acquitted and we saw a ton of protest. And that one moment is the moment of my childhood. And for them, they get one of those moments like every other month where the nation pauses and considers this a tragedy between law enforcement and a black uh, person that's been recorded, played out on national TV, police may or may not be prosecuted as a result and questioning, is this nation here to protect me? They experienced that with a rhythm that I never, uh, that I only had to deal with once before going off to college. And so that's the difference. Um, I'm still very hopeful about the America that they're growing up in. Uh, I do think they have uh, much more opportunity than my parents had, for example, but um, they, are, they are clouded, this America is clouded by the unprincipled actors who are seeking to divide us or make money off of division instead of uh, those who would seek to unite us. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, there's a question that just came in, but what about interracial marriage? Is that not one of the answers? 
it's, it's, so it's interesting. Um, I, I remember this comedian said the way racism will finally be solved in the United States is when we all look like Soledad O'Brien, yeah. <laughs> um, which is to say like we're basically breeded out of ourselves. Um, I, I, you know, who knows, in 50 years, there will certainly be um, more multiracial people uh, in the country. But what has happened in the past is, you know, Irish people, when they came here, were not considered white. And mm -hmm. Italian people, um, when they came here, especially from so southern Italy, were not considered white. They were considered Italian or, or Irish or Polish. And then they became white over time. And my sense is, if we don't deal with the core challenge of racism, then basically, whiteness will just expand to incorporate more people uh and then you will have you know it, like we have now on census forms hispanic you know are you of uh white of hispanic descent black of his or of hispanic descent i think it will be you know are you multiracial but identify as white are you multiracial and and so those there will just be new divisions uh, and categories that that splice us up if we don't deal with the core challenge um here's one interesting tidbit though something that's more unpopular than interracial marriage and even more unpopular than same-sex marriage right now is inter-party marriage and by this i mean uh people are saying that the um they are they do not approve of their children marrying someone from the other party i think somewhere it's something like only um uh something like 50 percent of republicans and nearly 40 percent of democrats would uh do not approve of their children marrying someone from the other party whereas uh 50 years ago that the, both numbers were under 10 percent uh, of um of, of disapproving. And so the high approval for inter-party marriage, now there's much lower approval. Those numbers, again, lower than, um, the, the disapproval numbers are higher uh, for inter-party than for interracial or same sex. So there's something happening in the nation that suggests um, um, there, there are some deep ideological issues we've got to wrestle with before uh, we can breed ourselves out of some of the challenges. Mm -hmm. We've got five minutes left. So any additional questions, feel free to, to submit them. Um, you know, the, these conversations are not easy to have. Um, and there's a lot of history as you've, you know, made clear um, often within within the context of them. And so I'm curious um, in this moment, as readers want to engage with each other and with others around these broader conversations, what is the takeaway from your book? And what is it that they can hopefully uh, gain from reading this in a way that could help either inform their own worldview or at least better engage with these, with these, with these conversations that are sometimes maybe a bit more sensitive. Yeah. Yeah. The, the biggest thing is that um, America is not a thought experiment. We we're in it, we're living it. And if we fail to meet the moment, then we will leave for posterity a worse America than we inherited. And none of us wants that no matter where we fall in the political aisle, like we on the political uh, discussion debate, we want to leave a better country behind than the one we were born into. Um, so we have to be proactive in addressing the things that, that are challenging us. And I argue that racism is one of the big ones. Um, and so, so that's one. Two is that it is possible to build this thing the world has never seen. It's very difficult. It's going to require sacrifice and forbearance from all involved. Uh, but um, either we believe in the ideals we espouse or they're just fancy words that we say to make ourselves feel good while we hoard much of the nation for ourselves to the exclusion of others. Uh, and so we have to believe that it's possible. And I think a, an optimistic, hopeful outlook um, is, is, uh, is useful in this regard, not to blind ourselves to the challenges, but to, uh, to sort of fuel us as we confront the challenges that are very real and very dire. Um, and the third thing is, it is like, I mean, the probably the most critical thing is that we get to know people who are not like us. Uh, if we look at the, the neighborhoods that we live in, the schools our kids go to, our churches, our, our you know, running clubs or whatever, they usually are filled with people who look like us. And um, that may be, if it may feel comfortable, it may feel, um, you know, safer or more stable, but it actually doesn't help the project of democracy in a, in a nation of 330 million people and, uh, and with such diversity. And so if you only, if you sort of sequester yourselves in homogenous groups, then you don't get to know the other Americans that you're trying to um, live up to these ideals with. And so the one thing we can all do immediately is to put ourselves in situations where we, where we are not in the majority and get to know people that we normally would not talk to, force those interactions, force that uh, um, un being uncomfortable, being vulnerable, 
um, and assume uh, the, the best intentions of those we engage with. And every interaction is not going to be perfect. They're all, they're all not going to turn into blooming friendships and, and allow you to work through all the nation's issues over, over wine. But um, the exposure will, you, will, you will find in the whole that they want the same thing from this country that you do. And it's not to take what you have and for themselves, and it's not to infringe on your rights, but it's just to realize as much of America as others have so that we can all share in this project together and build a country that's, that's worthy of, uh, of the children uh, to come and the, the generations to come. Uh, and, and, and we can all do that tomorrow. You know? And so um, whether we do or not is the question before us. Um, we can either fail to meet the moment and, and, uh, and prove that we are not the people we thought we were, or we can succeed and move the nation just a little bit closer to the, being that more perfect union that Lincoln talked about. That's great. Thank you. One final question. I think I don't see any others from the audience. And then, um, Amy, I will turn it back to you. But what gives you hope, if anything, um, for the future? Yeah, that, you know, no matter what's happening around us, there are always flashes of who we can be as a country. Uh, I think last summer, is an example of that. After George Floyd was murdered, which came on the heels of Breonna Taylor being killed and Ahmaud Arbery being killed by white vigilantes, um, um, there was a coronavirus pandemic that forced us all into our homes and made us social distance and sequester ourselves. Uh, the economy dropped out because of the coronavirus. And so lots of people were without income and without uh, jobs. And in the midst of all this, um, after George Floyd's murder, you see this uh, a, a, a mass of protests in every state in the union occurring every day for weeks on end across lines of race, across party lines, across generational lines. In places like Idaho, you're having Black Lives Matter marches, which is basically, um, you know, a, 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 the, the the, the marches were really about people being dissatisfied with, with how government was, was behaving. And that gave me hope to see all of these people. It was basically national solidarity in, in a, um, you know, sort of in a snapshot. And I was hoping that it would endure, um, especially going into an election season that was supposed to be really divisive. And yet we saw the highest voter turnout that we've seen in 120 years. This is an example of people re-engaging with the nation, suggesting we are not happy with what's happening here and we demand the nation be responsive to us. And so I was hopeful in that moment. Um, then then there, you know, um, the, the election was contested, uh, lots of false information came out about it, and then we get the January 6th Capitol insurrection, which sort of undoes the solidarity that we had experienced in the summer before. But uh, the fact that it showed its face in the first place last summer is proof that it's we have have the capacity to, to be those people. All we have to do is make it uh, and construct it in such a way that it is endure that it endures and that it's resilient to divisive appeals from those who seek to to capture and maintain power. Great. Well, thank you, Ted, um, and thank, thank you. you also for the audience. I know it's an evening um, event, and we appreciate your your time. Um, again, the book the to purchase the book is in the chat. So we hope you will purchase books, um, more than one, hopefully. Um, and with that, thank you, Ted. And then Amy, if you want to close us out. Thank you. And I'd like to thank both of our speakers tonight, Awista and Ted, for sharing your time with us and um, giving us a lot to think about and doing it in a, a positive way. You know, you, you did it with light and love. And um, so thank you very much for that. And I'd like to thank everyone for joining us tonight um, and have a great evening. <laughs>